Our continued look at mental health this month with a specific focus tonight on another disease, addiction. You're about to hear from some men and women who will tell you that treating addiction is a team effort, but the pandemic sidelining effects have made their daily struggle to stay sober all the much more difficult. So how does it all work and can you recognize if you're becoming addicted to something? Our Dan Harris has more. On a sunny day in Columbus, Ohio, 47-year-old Brian Strohacker takes a stroll through the park. It's part of his daily morning routine, one of the few things that has remained constant since he got sober eight months ago. And I'll take a good hour outside, and if I'm feeling any certain way, then again, I can come back to my house um, with, with three other like-minded people, and I can have a conversation if necessary. Brian spent nearly six months at a treatment center in Columbus, Ohio, called the House of Hope, which specializes in helping people with drug and or alcohol dependence. Now Brian lives with three other men who are also in recovery. He says that type of fellowship has been a major part of his rehabilitation from a life of addiction to cocaine, alcohol, and marijuana. There are uh, meetings that I go to uh, where I can go out and talk to other people like me, other addicts, other alcoholics, um, and share our experiences and, and uh, um, kind of feed off of each other. David Andy, who is now a peer recovery supporter at House of Hope, had a difficult journey with opioid addiction. The length of time that I was using was the more serious substances, about 10 years. Um, it started off with, with painkillers, and that was about eight years. And then towards the, the last two years um, of my addiction, I went on some more serious substances, uh, which was fentanyl. I started using opiates when I was 17 years old. Started using heroin when I was 17 years old, and I, uh, and I used heroin for, uh, for 11 years. Todd Henson and his girlfriend, Amanda Thomas, credit residential treatment to lifting them out of the grips of opioid addiction as well. I stayed there for four years. Um, I had a whole lot of um, trauma in my life that I needed to work through. Um, I learned a lot about myself and uh, the feelings that I have. They really gave me a lot of tools to live my life in, uh, in um, very healthy ways. But when the coronavirus pandemic hit, it brought with it societal changes such as social distancing and isolation, completely upending many models of treatment that center around socializing. And that's changed drastically because we don't have that 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 touch that we that we like. I mean, it's a um, I mean, it's it, it, when I say a fellowship, it's really like a, a new family for me. In 2018, nearly 22 million Americans, one in 13 of us, needed substance abuse treatment, but only 3.7 million people actually received treatment that same year. The numbers show that sobriety can be hard to maintain. More than 60% of people who've been treated for substance abuse disorders relapse within a year of completing treatment. Many in recovery often rely on in-person community meetings like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, which have largely now gone virtual. Addiction expert Jessica Halsey says right now can be a very destabilizing time for anybody in recovery. The pandemic's shutdown requirements mean that those individuals who have a substance use disorder who are in recovery are losing access to their support systems. That's really part of their recovery support uh, to keep them healthy and, and um, connected to other individuals, um, which is very, very challenging. And with the risk of relapse heightened, those challenges can be very difficult for some. Reports of overdose deaths have been spiking in some areas. Tommy Begress, a paramedic from just outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan, has witnessed the effects firsthand. Yeah, we have seen an increase uh, in overdose, uh, overdose toxic events or accidental overdoses because of the recent changes in prescribing habits because there had to be alterations made to accommodate for social distancing. And I think it's important to understand that even if a patient has uh, been in treatment, when they're cut off from that treatment, those withdrawal symptoms are still going to come back for many of those. 
and they're going to find a way to self-treat those. It's important to remember that addiction is a chronic brain disease where users continue to engage in compulsive behavior despite the harmful consequences. Your brain rewards healthy behaviors like exercise or eating by switching on feel-good brain circuits and releasing a chemical called dopamine. When you're in danger, your brain sends your body into survival or fight or flight mode, releasing a chemical called epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. This system of brain chemistry reinforces behaviors associated with rewards and prevents behaviors leading to pain. Addiction happens when that natural wiring of your brain begins to actually work against you. Substances such as drugs, alcohol, sugar, and tobacco activate the reward system, giving you the sensation of being rewarded, which leaves you craving more and more. From illicit drugs like fentanyl and heroin, to cigarettes, to overeating and gambling, addiction experts say it is in times of heightened stress, and a pandemic certainly qualifies, when our brain could be triggered to return to those habits. One of the top three predictors of relapse is stress and i would include in that anxiety and and i certainly see this clinically you know my patients are most likely to relapse when they've had a major stress or they've lost a job or they've gone through a, a relationship breakup on a population level we all probably have a certain amount of anxiety and once you go over some threshold that anxiety uh, can lead to somebody using a substance or relapsing or starting to l learn to drink more um, when they hadn't been drinking that much before. According to a recent poll, 56% of Americans say COVID-19 has had a major impact on their lives, from record-breaking job losses to forced isolation and a rising death toll. The coronavirus pandemic has brought all of our lives to a screeching halt. Whether it's people who've you know, been suffering with addictions, their addiction's getting worse, or people who haven't suffered with addictions starting to form, you know, habits or addictions, you know, everything from things that seemingly are benign, you know, they, they look back two weeks later and they've been drinking several drinks every day, you know, and, and hadn't done that before. But it's just their new habit, you know, because they don't know how else to deal with the stress. According to Dr. Judson Brewer and many other experts, practicing mindfulness can bring awareness to how moments of indulgence can drive our behavior. You know, when we see how these habits are formed, we can specifically see how mindfulness jumps in there and targets those mechanisms, both through formal mindfulness practice, you know, through meditation, and also through informal mindfulness practice. So in that moment, paying attention. Back in Ohio, David practices mindfulness meditation to stay on the road to recovery. I pray when I get up in the morning. I meditate. I have this morning routine that, that, I, that I was doing even before the pandemic started. Um, like a lot of us in recovery do. I know the guys here in, in my recovery residence um, that they practice it. That has been number one um, for me is prayer and meditation. Todd and Amanda say the habits they've been working on for years are helping them keep up their sobriety even during these wrenching times. If I put one foot in front of the other and just recognize these little rewards, these little things and be grateful you know, along the way, then these rewards or this deferred gratification it's gonna have a lot more longevity. It's gonna be something I could hang on to for, uh, for a long time, maybe even forever. For those who think they may need help and don't know where to begin, there are tools available to start the process of recovery today. Google uh, can, can be your friend. I know even for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to going to 12 step meetings. And one way that I find the online um, AA meetings is through Google. And I thank God like for these online 12 step meetings, the only difference it makes it not being the same is just just the face to face and social interactions. I still get a lot out of these meetings. Thankfully, with technology, um, the, the, the different uh, communication apps, the different uh, meeting apps that, 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 that we're, uh, uh, you know, uh, fortunate enough to have access to, we can still get out and do a lot of the same things, if not all of the same things we were able to do before. Um, and, and then that's something I'm really grateful for. Give yourself a chance um, and you might like the person that you become. 
And Dan Harris joins us now, Dan. Certainly an important story anytime, but especially now. And Dr. Brewer, who you talked to in that piece, he really talks about addiction as a spectrum. Explain that concept to us. You can think about it, as you said, like a spectrum, as he talks about it. One end, you have hardcore addictions, but we're all somewhere right. on the spectrum. Maybe we're in the middle with just a little bit too much eating when we're stressed right. or checking our phone too much. And when you add an enormous amount of stress and anxiety into the system, it can move many of us down the spectrum toward the hardcore addictions. And he talks about as far as treating his patients using mindfulness and meditation. How does that work? Okay, so you can think about uh, mindfulness or meditation as a way to kind of get you out of your head, to get you into your body sure. in some way. So you have uh, somebody, he will have his patients focus on the feeling of their breath coming in and going out, or just on the feeling in their feet. It's just a, a way, just to get you out of the swirling stories in your head. And that can then give you some distance from your urges and emotions. Well, it really does two things. One is it calms you down. There's physiological positive response. When we stop thinking for just a second, uh, even though you're going to get distracted a bunch, but you will stop thinking just a little bit. And the other is that it gives you a chance to really investigate how your mind works. And when you see the wildness of your own mind, then it doesn't own you as much. And, and you and I have talked about that before. And it makes sense like when it comes to stress and de-stressing. But is it really going to stop you from getting another drink or looking at your phone again. He's got a lot of evidence to suggest mm. that it really does, and he's been working with patients for many years on this. Think about um, addiction as really, as he described in that piece, a bad habit. Mm. So it's all about habits, and you can think about habits as a habit loop. This is the way he describes it. So it's got three steps. The cue, so something happens um, in your life that's stressful, that's the cue. Then there's a routine, so something stresses you out, and then you launch into a habitual routine. Maybe you eat uh, a bunch of Oreos, or you, have, uh, you drink a bunch of beer. And then the third is the reward. When you have sugar or alcohol, it can trigger the pleasure centers in your brain. What happens with meditation is the cue hits, something stresses you out, and instead of launching blindly into the routine, you might pause, take a breath, get out of your head and into your body, and let the urge come and go, and then you can make a wiser decision. Do I need to eat this thing right now? Do I need to drink this thing? And that's how you break that cycle. I saw a, a meme the other day. It was intended to be funny, and it was of like a giant football stadium packed with people, and it said, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous for 2021. What about good old-fashioned group therapy and talking, and people who normally would go to Alcoholics Anonymous, are they still Zooming, and, yes. and how important is that to, to be able to talk to somebody? Therapy, I mean, look, uh, Brewer, Judd Brewer, Dr. Brewer, is really focused on both. He does a lot of teaching his patients how to meditate, but he also does talk therapy, and that's mm -hmm. incredibly powerful. Powerful, and he's been becoming increasingly convinced that you can do that virtually. You can do it over Zoom, even over text. But here's the problem. Even before the pandemic, BC, before Corona, as, as Dr. Brewer refers to it, we didn't, we didn't have, people didn't have enough access to mental health care. And now we're heading into a true global mental health emergency, and people are really not going to have another, enough access to this. I think this is the quiet pandemic. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. And a reminder for everyone to follow Dan's podcast, 10% Happier, wherever you get your podcast. He's got more on how you can improve your life. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.